Space Cowboy Books presents Simultaneous Times, a science and speculative fiction podcast. Short stories to stir the imagination by contemporary authors. Three to Go by Rhea Reese, with music by Fog Machine, read by Jean-Paul Garnier. The virtual reality suite lays dormant, waiting for me to start my next outcome session. I take the headset and gloves from the entryway, mentally preparing for today's new brand of torture. Okay, ready. The program starts. And I stand in a virtual space reserved as a waiting zone, a white void that swallows all sounds, blinding and featureless. A holographic readout appears in front of me. Potential outcomes. 3,456,908. 3,456,908. It ticks down by one, and the simulation changes into a smoky hellscape. The hologram ticker changes once again. Operation previously confirmed. Next outcome loading. I'm underwater, drowning in a world of endless flooding. Operation confirmed. Next outcome. Faster now, the numbers shrink, and my surroundings shift and morph as the display rapidly approaches triple digits. Nuclear fallout, worldwide riots, chemical warfare, the aftermath of a multivirus pandemic. The simulation displays each horror to me in fully realized definition. Potential outcomes, 972, I cradle my head as another thousand realities flash around me. After all this time, I should be used to this. But my skull screams in agony. The Outcomes Project has taken us over 12 years. Day by day, our system has calculated each outcome for our planet. Each potential future downfall for humanity. And we've observed them. We've experienced almost every main branch of possibility now, an endless procession of potential outcomes. The result is always the same. We always bring Earth to its end, through neglect, or lust for power, or a myriad of other shortcomings. Sometimes, we get close to achieving a utopian society, until the random chaos of the universe takes over and brings about our downfall by some other means. I'll be frank, it isn't going well. Potential outcomes, four, operator input required, 2378 CE. I shake off the nausea from my bumpy transition to take in my surroundings. I stand in the middle of a vast lake my feet hovering a few inches above the water's surface. Mountains stretch out around me, lush and green, dotted with fluffy white specks bleeding in the distance. Of all the outcomes I've witnessed so far, this one feels most like home, like my childhood. I glance at the readout again. Reality probability. 0.00000274554 I swallow a lump in my throat I've never seen this earth The odds are heavily against it But I have a duty to fulfill To learn from it What threatens this reality? What can be done to prevent it? Then I look up And a gigantic fireball catches my eye streaking across the blue sky. It leaves a white hot line of flame in its wake. It crashes through the ozone layer and the atmosphere itself seems to ripple around the point of insertion. 
I pinch my wrist. It's coming. I haven't had to endure this type of outcome for a few months, but I remember well enough how painful it is. The meteor lands in the distance. The ground rumbles beneath my feet and a scorching blast of air follows a few seconds later. A vast cloud of dust and flame billows toward me. We're disintegrated. Me, the lake, and the sheep. The sim reverses, and the world and I are remade. I stand gasping. I can still feel my flesh burning from my bones. I'm on a pristine beach, the ocean stretching either side for miles. And there's the meteor, burning across the sky, enormous enough to blot out the sun. Holiday makers panic, fleeing in a tangled mess of limbs. Their screams pierce the air over the low boom of the meteor as it breaks Atmo. It streaks downward and explodes on impact, out of sight. We're disintegrated. Me, the ocean, the tourists. I relive the outcome over and over again, experiencing the agony of death by meteor. There are no options here. Not when I spawn in the countryside or a city or a laboratory. Every iteration has the same consequences. The meteor is too large, too fast. The early warning systems miscalculated. There are no answers here. I exit the sim hours later, exhausted and weak at the knees. I fetch my belongings from the empty locker room. The lights blink off behind me one by one as I pace the abandoned corridors of the research building. This place once hummed with the activities of over 500 operators, just like me, wading through simulated outcomes, hoping to find the one. But there's no one left. It's just me. The others gave up years ago. Stepping out onto the streets, a wall of noise, smoke and fumes punches me in the face. I shrug on my coat and turn the collar, walking home along crowded sidewalks. Three more simulations to go and my job will be done. I can only hope one of them has some answers. Someone has to hope. Ghosts by Michael Butterworth, with music by Julie Carpenter, read by the author. Ghosts. The bomb explodes because of the emptiness. The land shrinks from a fiery breath. And once again, there is only the calm and quiet of space, lapping at the earth like a great and timeless sea. Only a thin and lifeless chill that blows on the land as it used to be. Reason says that I stand alone, listening to this wind, comprehending this new wasteland. But I feel inchoate, a limb without means. There can be no person such as I, only the chance projections from the past that bob up and down on the wind, too frightened to endure. No man to appreciate the futility of life lost after so much by those who tried to fathom the hard beauty of the stars. No other to walk in admiration of man's fleeting majesty, for the stars are too far. The flesh will destroy itself wherever it springs. There can now only be truth a harsh, unperceived beauty of matter, glimpsed yet unglimpsed during mankind's life. A glorious peep show beyond death to which all men have striven, 
and at last achieved. A phantom housewife, complete with apron, brush and crying child, appeared before me despairingly in the air. I tried to do my best and suckle up to my husband and bring up our son. It was my husband who never played true, who made my life an agony from beginning to end and took my mind off what I really wanted to do. My real aim in life was to be a model, a glamour girl, who all men would love, who could rule all eternity. I would have stopped the war and saved the world from this. She fled with her struggling child, impelled by the wind, her form weaker now and less able to exist. But her bit had been said and her last role played out to its utmost. A car worker took her place, his ghostly skin dulled and listless, but his eyes aglint with a final energy. I worked fucking hard fixing panels to chassis, day after day stinking with sweat and fouling my lungs with metal dust. The noise of the line was never out of my ears. The monotony drove me mad and I never wanted to do that god-awful job in the first place. But with a wife and kids, what can you do but buckle down? What I wanted was to be a player on the pitch. I was good at rugger, but after I got married, somehow there was never the time. I got more interested in getting my wage rise than watching what was happening. The man belched and farted, and he too began fading, joining the spore of particles left behind by the woman. A novelist appeared next, his hair long and wild, his body tall and lean, still with the clothes he wore on on the day he died. He opened both his arms in a gesture of despair and shook his head. Of course, I saw it all coming. I warned the world in advance, but no one listened. During my life, I achieved what I wanted to, one of the lucky ones, I suppose, but only at great expense to my family and others. Nevertheless, I was able to tour the world, having a quiet word in everyone's ear, and I put in my bit to save you all. Still shaking his head, but looking faintly happy now, he was carried away on the wind, papers streaming from his arms, the useless efforts of his life's work. A farmer pulled up in the cab of his tractor, its engine shimmering and roaring as though real. His lips were pursed in tight amusement, but his head was sunk with restrained anger and his eyes stared frozenly from their sockets. I too knew what was going on. How could I ignore it when my fields were withering from insecticides and my soils turning to fertiliser dust? My animals were cruelly treated to make ends meet. I was forced into a position to which I never wanted to find myself. What I wanted was to be at one with the earth, to enrich in its soil, not to strip it. But the pigs in the cities, the hungry bastards, ate everything, faster than I could produce it, and still wanted more. In the end, I took my kerosene to the cities to burn them down. But by then it was too late. He shook his fists at the sand clouds in a sudden last expression of his reasonable body. Then he turned back to his controls and revved quickly away, depriving the wind of its part. An economist appeared, laughing loudly and shaking all over with his nerves. He wore a suit and a gold clock strapped to his wrist that he consulted to keep informed of elapsed time. Ha! You would like to blame me, but I can tell you with all honesty I knew nothing. My system was good, and my advice given in good faith. I practised all my life to make sure that I became a man of the world, before giving you my secrets. I always wanted to be what I was. I love my job, and I'm sorry now that we can't all be around to continue. 
A silken scarf which he had been carrying to wipe his brow fluttered by him in the wind and gagged on his mouth, muffling the final words he wanted to say. An industrialist trod the empty spot, looking warily about him as he spoke. I never wanted to be an industrialist, I wanted to be a poet and saw on high taking the whole human race with me. But I was no good with words, and the words I did produce never gave me a proper income. I was forced to prostitute what little talent I possessed and go into the business. I was unhappy and lonely, but as I rose higher, I eventually began to reach the limits I had set myself as a poet, and for a while I grew happy with my lot. But instead of elevating my fellow men, I left them blind and purposeless. And I must confess that it might have been I who conferred with colleagues and international governments and unwittingly created the conditions that have led to this. Frightened and cowed, his visage was torn apart by a sudden, unexplained fury in the wind, and his ghostly fragments were spun away into space. A politician reluctantly appeared, smiling and then frowning, at first speechless and dressless, his words finding no sure direction, his clothes no occasion. But eventually he spoke, and as he did, the earth trembled and shook. Gaping cracks appeared in the desert, mountains tumbled down behind him, and when he had finished his brilliant oratory, Applause soared from behind the sky in a continuous beating thunder that echoed round the globe, sounding his curtain. Then the cleansing wind gathered his protesting form on its way. Next came a holy man, a priest, an imam, a rabbi. Smoothing down his apparel, and holding up a single finger to command attention from the whistling sand. It was I who conferred with brothers and believers around the world in our grief and anger, who brought down Gomorrah. In the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, was it not said that Jesus, the Messiah Muhammad, will reign again? And finally, in the debris, a virgin ballerina appeared. Her sure white legs extended and her graceful arms curved above her arched spine. She trilled on her toes before launching herself across the sand. Her ghost the last and most difficult to depart as she carried all men and women, all ages and all promise of the future away in her movement. There can be no plea for vanity only pale mental residues, shadows of a former life. And only these ghosts, the striven memories of men, can find a purpose in the wind, carried around the globe in storms of dust, chattering and arguing about the rights and wrongs, the echoes of a past that will never finally fade, but will always travel outward through space, long after the earth herself has crumbled and the stars have rearranged. In this episode of Simultaneous Times, you heard Three to Go by Rhea Reese, with music by Fog Machine, and Ghosts by Michael Butterworth, with music by Julie Carpenter. Ghost is an excerpt from Space Cowboy Book's latest release, Complete Poems 1965 to 2020 by Michael Butterworth. Get your copy at spacecowboybooks.com. Theme music by Dane Luscombe. Come visit us at our bookstore in Joshua Tree or online at spacecowboybooks.com. 
don't forget to subscribe. And visit us on Instagram and Twitter. We'd love to know what you think of the show.